Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by and welcome to the BJ's Wholesale Club third quarter fiscal 2020 earnings conference call. At this time, our participants are in a listening only mode. After the speaker's presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question during the session, you will need to press star one on your telephone. If you require any further assistance, please press star zero. I would now like to hand the conference over to your speaker today, Sutton Freyher, Vice President, Investor Relations. Thank you. Please go ahead, Madam. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining BJ's Wholesale Club's third quarter fiscal 2020 earnings conference call. Lee Delaney, President, CEO, Bob Eddy, Chief Financial and Administrative Officer, and Bill Werner, Senior Vice President, Strategic Planning and Investor Relations are on the call. Please remember that during this call, we may make forward-looking statements within the meaning of the federal securities laws. These statements are based on our current expectations and involve risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results to differ materially from our expectations described on this call. Please see the risk factors section of our Form 10-K filed with the SEC on March 19, 2020 for a description of those risks and uncertainties. Finally, please note that on today's call, we will refer to certain non-GAAP financial measures that we believe will provide useful information for investors. The presentation of this information is not intended to be considered in isolation or as a substitute for the financial information presented in accordance with GAAP. Please refer to today's press release posted on the investor section of our website for a reconciliation of these non-GAAP financial measures to the most comparable measures prepared in accordance with GAAP. With that, I'll turn the call over to Lee. Good morning, and thank you for joining us. I hope you are healthy and safe. Q3 was another outstanding quarter with considerable strategic, operational, and financial success. We are clearly benefiting from a unique combination of factors, allowing us to dramatically accelerate our transformation and strengthen our business for the future. For the balance of my remarks, I will describe the major factors contributing to our success and discuss their implications for our future. First, our team has been amazing, and I could not be prouder of them. They have stepped up to meet incredible challenges all year. Across our distribution centers, clubs, and home office, our team's creativity, resilience, and dedication has been so impressive. They have kept safety as our highest priority with extensive protocols to ensure a safe and healthy environment for our entire community. In partnership with our vendors, who too have been incredible, our team has continued to provide for members when they needed us most. Let me offer my sincere thanks to everyone who has and will continue to power our success. I deeply appreciate your contributions and partnership. We continue to support our team with investments in bonuses, enhanced benefits, and safety measures. Year to date, we have invested $128 million in these practices and will continue to prioritize our team's well-being. Importantly, we have also upgraded our team's capability over the last six months with key senior hires in membership, marketing, merchandising, digital, analytics, operations, and IT. We know these recent additions will further speed our transformation, and we expect to continue to invest in great talent as we become an even more attractive employer. Second, and perhaps most obviously, we remain on trend. Members are consolidating their trips buying bigger baskets in response to the pandemic and searching for savings given broad economic anxiety. Our industry-leading value, bulk sizes, and broad category participation work exceptionally well in these times. As a result, we have gained considerable share. More than half our growth was driven by share gains based on IRI data. Furthermore, our growth outpaced the market by more than twofold, and we gained share in more than 90% of the categories we track. For example, our perishables business outpaced the market by more than two times, and our non-edible grocery business grew at 8x the rate of the market. Our strongest share gains occurred outside our core Northeast geography as more people discovered our relevance. These share gains outside of our core markets further support our confidence that we can successfully expand our reach and assert our relevance far beyond the Northeast. And we are gaining share digitally. We anticipate elevated shopping trends will continue well into 2021, given the current state of the pandemic, likely timeline for vaccine distribution, 
and ongoing unemployment trends. Third, I believe our business model is competitively advantaged for current and future times. We run large clubs and distribution facilities with capacity for growth as others are closing stores. We operate efficiently with focused labor and lower marginal expenses, positioning us favorably should wages rise. We sell a limited selection of larger size items, offering advantaged economics in a more digital world. We offer industry-leading value, critical as prices become more transparent and consumers seek out savings. All these factors will allow us to meet elevated levels of demand with favorable economics under nearly all potential future environments. Our Q3 share gain and profit is evidence of these structural business model advantages. Finally, we've accelerated our transformation in six key areas, growing our membership, delivering value, improving convenience with digital, expanding our footprint, lowering our cost position, and improving our capital structure. Let me say a bit more about each. From a membership standpoint, we are ahead of our expectations on all metrics. We continue to attract new members at high rates and retention remains robust. Our tenured members and new members continue to shop at elevated levels, driving increased trips to our clubs. In addition, new members continue to skew younger and engage more with our digital platforms. We are leaning into membership investments to drive acquisition and engagement. Through our data-driven approach, we are focused on attracting members with the highest lifetime value. Similarly, we are also concentrating on retaining members by helping them discover all the ways in which BJs can deliver value. These efforts have powered 12% growth in our total member base year over year. These investments also drove a meaningful improvement in the quality of membership. This quarter, our highest tier penetration increased by 200 basis points to 30% of total members compared to the prior year period. Higher tier members renew at much higher rates and have greater lifetime value. We expect gains in membership, size, and quality will yield benefits well beyond the current environment. Assortment optimization remains a key initiative to deliver value to our members. We continue to work hard to remain in stock on high demand essential products and have quickly pivoted to add new suppliers and categories. In stock levels improved this quarter and we continue to mitigate supply chain challenges. Our strategy remains consistent, simplify to expand into high growth and high demand areas and remain agile with our space to meet member demand. This quarter, we expanded our assortment in categories where we were historically underpenetrated, including fitness equipment, household goods, indoor furniture, and select consumer electronics categories. We accelerated the reset of our food business with more healthy and organic options in the first half of this year. These changes drove market share gains in several categories, including alternative snacking, where we grew our sales eight times the market rate. We also saw significant share gains in many perishable categories with growth two to three times the market. Our new prepared foods business also gained share. We know these improvements will serve us well with the younger new members we have recently added. Let me touch on our holiday planning. First, we pulled our Black Friday deals to start earlier in November with a seamless experience across all channels and an enhanced focus on relevant categories like furniture, fitness and recreation, small appliances, housewares, and consumer electronics. We have adapted our grocery offering to account for fewer large gatherings, for example, by downsizing our party platters and buying more small turkeys. While we anticipate some headwinds from fewer holiday gatherings, we feel great about our holiday assortment. From a services standpoint, the team continues to enhance our capabilities. Services, including optical, cellular, and home improvement, all return to growth. We recently relaunched our major appliances business with a new assortment and improved digital experience, and it is growing at a significantly faster rate. We believe services will be a significant growth driver for many years to come. Our digitally enabled sales grew by approximately 200% this quarter. Our biggest gains came in channels where our economics are most attractive, with Buy Online Pickup and Club, or BOPIC, and Same Day Delivery representing three quarters of the growth. The growth in our digital platforms continues to surpass our expectations. In the last nine months, we have grown by more than four times all of last year's growth. This quarter, we expanded BOPIC to include curbside service, including fresh and frozen grocery items chain-wide. Although still early, results from this expanded offering have been very promising. For example, roughly 40% of our BOPIC orders post-launch were delivered curbside. We will continue to aggressively invest into digital platforms given their increased relevance and our competitively advantaged economics. 
We believe shifts to digital will bode well for us on the top and bottom line. Our efforts to expand our footprint are progressing well. We remain on track to open two new clubs in New York at the end of this fiscal year for a total of four this year and as many as six clubs next year. To further expand our reach, we are pursuing additional locations in new and existing markets with a focus on attractive demographics. We are pleased with the performance of our clubs so far, especially from a membership standpoint, where in Michigan, our members per club average is 20% better than the chain-wide average. We plan to invest aggressively to support our new clubs given our ability to gain share in new markets and the performance of recent openings, the latter of which continues to run ahead of expectations. All told, we expect greater unit growth to be a multi-year growth factor. Our cost reduction efforts and enhanced balance sheet afford us increased flexibility to invest in our business and return capital to shareholders. We remain on track with our project momentum cost reduction goals and have used this year's considerable free cash flow to transform our balance sheet. Our leverage now stands at 1.3 times EBITDA compared to 2.9 times a year ago and we return capital to shareholders by opportunistically buying back shares. Before I turn the call over to Bob, let me leave you with a few takeaways. Our business has been transformed and we expect to continue to gain share over the near and long term. We are well positioned structurally and strategically with an extremely relevant and extendable value proposition, a growing and upgraded member base, advantaged digital capabilities, faster unit growth and geographic expansion, and a better cost position and transformed balance sheet. As we look past the current environment, we see a stronger business with robust sales, higher profitability, and strong cash flows. With that, I'll turn the call over to Bob. Bob? Thanks, Lee, and good morning, everyone. Before I begin, I would also like to take this opportunity to thank our team members for their hard work and dedication during this truly remarkable year. We continue to execute at the highest standards and drive industry-leading results. Net sales for the quarter were $3.6 billion. Merchandise comp sales, which exclude sales of gasoline, increased by 18.5% and were driven by both traffic and ticket. We continue to see more members, tenured and new, shopping in our clubs, expanding their baskets, and penetrating all categories. These trends were consistent across our geographies. We saw consistently strong merchandise comp sales during the quarter. Each month's comp was within 100 basis points of our quarterly comp. October's merchandise comp was slightly over 18% and strengthened towards the end of the month. The consistency of our monthly performance, coupled with the expanded market share, gives us confidence that the underlying strength we have gained will outlast the transient benefits of the pandemic. Merchandise comps have continued to strengthen since the end of the quarter. In the first three weeks of November, we are running north of 20%, with strength across almost all categories, as we continue to see increased food at home trends and consumer home investments in addition to earlier holiday shopping. While we are pleased with our early fourth quarter comps, it's difficult for us to predict how the rest of the quarter will play out given the number of significant uncertainties, such as inventory availability, and member behavior during the holidays, namely as it relates to entertaining. Our digitally enabled sales grew by approximately 200% and drove about four full percentage points of our 18.5% merchandise comp. As Lee noted, we are aggressively investing behind our digital platforms, particularly in BOPIC and same-day delivery, which together drove three quarters of our digital growth. As you know, our economics are advantaged versus our peers. We operate a limited SKU warehouse environment with significantly higher average tickets, allowing us to be much more efficient. BOPIC and curbside sales tend to skew towards bigger baskets, and same-day delivery sales have the same margins as traditional sales in our clubs. Additionally, digitally engaged members appear to shop much more than those that only interact with us through traditional means. Comps in our grocery division grew by 19%. We saw robust comps across all categories, most notably in perishables, where we saw strong growth in fresh meat, frozen meals, and fresh produce. As Lee noted, our perishables division grew more than twice as fast as the rest of the market. In edible grocery, we saw robust growth in beverages and salty snacks and grew twice as fast as the rest of the market in those categories as well. 
In our non-edible grocery division, we continue to see strong growth in paper products, cleaning supplies, and health and beauty items. Our growth outpaced the market by 20 times in health and beauty and by a little bit more than twofold in household goods and cleaning. Our in-stock levels improved throughout the quarter as our team worked tirelessly with both existing and new suppliers. Our general merchandise and services division saw a comp growth of 13%, driven by strong sales of TVs, computer equipment, and other home-related categories, such as indoor furniture and small appliances. Although we made great progress, our services business is still ramping back to its full run rate potential and represents a great opportunity for growth in the new year. In our gasoline business, although sales were impacted by lower prices, our gallons sold at comp clubs increased year over year by about 2%. This performance outpaced a significant decline in the overall market. This is yet another great example of our continued gains in market share. Membership fee income, or MFI, grew by 11% during the third quarter to $85 million. MFI growth was driven by new members, renewals, and membership mix. We continue to grow total paid members compared to last year, adding a little bit more than 630,000 members on a net basis. To put this in perspective, historically we would have added between 200,000 and 250,000 net new members year over year. Along with terrific increases in our membership count, we also improved the quality of our membership significantly. For example, our penetration of higher tier memberships increased to 30% and easy renewal enrollment is at 70%. Also, we recently passed another important milestone by acquiring our 1 millionth co-brand credit card holder. These are our best members and they renew at significantly higher rates. We remain very excited about the membership growth we've seen year to date and are focused on retaining these members who we expect will be sticky given their shopping behavior. Let's move now to our gross margins. Excluding the gasoline business, our merchandise gross margin rate increased by 10 basis points driven by CPI initiatives, which were partially offset by increased COVID-related distribution costs and investments in price, particularly in areas experiencing some inflation. Investing in price is a bedrock principle of our business in order that we sustain our outstanding value to members, especially in these tough times. SG&A expenses for the quarter were $552 million and included approximately $17 million of total costs associated with the pandemic. These costs were primarily driven by increased labor, safety, and sanitation costs and our bonus incentive program. During the third quarter, we were able to better leverage our SG&A by a little more than 100 basis points. Given the current trajectory of the pandemic, we expect to incur more incremental expenses associated with COVID-19 in Q4. Costs related to team member bonuses and ensuring we keep members and team members healthy and safe are expected to be 30 to $35 million. Our adjusted EBITDA grew by 57% to $242 million, reflecting the robust sales beat, growing margins, and disciplined expense management, slightly offset by investments in our business and the safety of our team members. Adjusted net income in the third quarter was $128 million, or $0.92 cents per share, and reflected an incredible 124% year-over-year growth on a per-share basis. Our earnings growth highlights the strength of our revenues, our disciplined expense management, and reduced interest expense. We've generated a record $675 million of free cash flow so far this year. We don't typically generate much cash in Q3 as we position our inventory for the holiday season. Coming out of Q3 ahead of the game, we feel great about our ability to build on our year-to-date performance in Q4. From a capital allocation standpoint, our strategy remains consistent. Our overwhelming priority is investing in our business and expanding our footprint. Our next priority is the continuing improvement of our balance sheet. The current year's tremendous free cash flow has allowed us to repay nearly $575 million in debt. Ultimately, we ended the quarter with a funded net debt to adjusted EBITDA ratio of 1.3 times. As we go forward, we will look to target a funded debt level of approximately one times adjusted EBITDA. Finally, we will look towards returns of capital to shareholders. From a capital return standpoint, we bought back $50 million worth of shares in the quarter, 
Year-to-date, we have returned approximately $88 million to our shareholders by repurchasing 2.3 million shares. We will also opportunistically look to optimize our balance sheet. During the third quarter, we used $100 million of excess cash and borrowed $260 million from our revolver to reduce our first lien debt by a total of $360 million. In connection with this transaction, and shortly after the conclusion of the quarter, we terminated one of our interest rate swaps with $360 million of notional value. The combination of these changes will result in interest expense savings of approximately $10 million on an annualized basis. Let's now touch on our outlook. The current environment remains challenging and unpredictable. There are several uncertainties and factors that would impact our business, including the evolution of the pandemic, government stimulus, consumer behavior, and unemployment levels. As a result, it remains extremely difficult for us to forecast how the fourth quarter or next year will play out in great specificity. Given these uncertainties, we will again refrain from offering guidance. With that said, we have a larger and more meaningful business with industry-leading comps and incredible membership trends, and we are accelerating investments to improve all aspects of our business. Given the current trends in the public health crisis, we believe that the push toward food at home will remain robust for Q4 and well into the next year. We also believe that, with the election behind us, a new stimulus package may have the potential to gain more momentum in Washington. Both of those factors should drive our business even more. Like others, we continue to work through inventory availability challenges and await how holiday entertaining plays out in the coming months. The net of all these items should be bullish for us. While we've had some good news in the race for a vaccine, it will most likely take many months to get enough people inoculated to improve the public health crisis. Further, consumer behavior in our geographies has certainly changed to our advantage, and we expect this change to be sustained for the foreseeable future. As a result, we continue to believe that our long-term growth algorithm significantly outpaces the plan we laid out at our IPO. To wrap up, we are extremely pleased with our financial performance. Investments made in prior years have set the stage for our great performance so far this year. We continue to invest behind our strategic priorities as we leverage this extraordinary and challenging set of circumstances. As we look beyond today's environment, we believe we are well positioned given the nature of our business model our sizable share gains, and our transformed balance sheet. And finally, we have a team that continues to execute at the highest level against elevated and bolder expectations, enabling us to truly transform BJ's Wholesale Club. And now I'll turn the call back over to the operator to begin the Q&A session. As a reminder, to ask a question, you will need to press star one on your telephone. To withdraw your question, press the pound or hash key. Please stand by while we compile the Q&A roster. Your first question comes from Robbie Omes of B of A Securities. Your line is open. Oh, thanks. Good morning, guys, and uh, you know, terrific quarter. Just a you know, great execution. Um, actually, you know, two two questions. One, I just wanted to um, ask about the the membership uh, growth rate. I think it was 11 percent for the quarter, and so it's um, you know sequentially accelerated a little bit. It looks like from the second quarter. But can you just uh, you know remind us how to think about how that could look going forward? And also, you know, is there a slowdown in new member growth you know happening the further that you're moving into this year? And and how how uh, can you give us any thoughts on how we should think about what that could look like for um, next year? And then my second question is just on um, you know ex- accelerating. Uh, you know, store growth, um, you know, maybe some, some more color on how much you might start looking to really accelerate outside the Northeast, given what you're seeing in new stores and, uh, you know, maybe what regions you might be uh, doing more stores in as you look out over the next few years. Thanks. Hey, Robbie, this is, this is Bob. I'll take, uh, I think, both of those questions. Thank you for, for both of them and, and for the good wishes on a, on a great quarter. Um, you know, membership is, is, the, is the bedrock of the business. I think as we sit here and stare at the numbers, we see uh, a membership of, of record size with strong momentum and great and improving quality. Uh, in terms of the size, we built on our 6 million uh, member record from, from the second quarter. 
and and total members on a net basis are up 12 percent year over year so we're, we're very impressed with with that continued growth from a momentum perspective uh, mfi growth accelerated from from q1 and q2 on on the, on the pnl and that's an important an important feature uh, more importantly uh, members are responding to the investments we're making uh, and did so throughout the quarter uh, as to the quality point, uh, d- despite growing the overall membership, we were also able to improve our, our premium tier penetration to 30 uh, percent, improve our easy renewal penetration to 70 percent to get to the one million uh, co-brand card holder, which is an important milestone. And we continue to see robust shopping behaviors a- across the portfolio, uh, w- which make us believe that these, these gains will be sticky going forward. Uh, you're, you're correct to, to point out there was a, a, a touch of a, a slowdown, uh, and, and we, we did uh, we did miss our guide by a couple hundred thousand dollars. Uh, you know, I guess what I'd say to that is many things uh, impact MFI, uh, including the absolute member count, TYLY acquisition campaign timing and performance, the calendar uh, month end versus a quarter end versus the fiscal quarter end as it relates to easy renewals. Uh, footsteps in the club, and on and on and on and on. Uh, and so, one way is to to look at it is to think about uh, you know the the, the slight uh, the slight miss or a slight slowdown. Uh, the the better view, I think, in our in our estimation, is to really consider the record size and momentum and, and quality. Uh, we don't see those things uh, uh, slowing down in in, in our uh, in our view, and hopefully, as we get uh, you know, through the, the rest of this fiscal year and, and into into next year, we continue to build on the gains on all, all three of those phases, right? Record, record size and strong momentum and great quality. Um, as, you, as you think about store growth, certainly we've, we've talked about that being our, our biggest priority in terms of investment in the, uh, in the company. We've made great strides in building a uh, portfolio of clubs we can, we can bring to bear. Uh, we are on track this year to get to four clubs uh, as you know, we opened one in Michigan and one in Pensacola, Florida already this year. We have two set to open in January, one in Newburgh, New York, and one in Long Island City, New York. Those are those are right on track to open in January. As, uh, as, as we said on our last earnings call, and our team is working uh, with great haste to get that done. Uh, we're excited for, for those clubs. Uh, as we get to next year, we've talked about six or more, and, and we are still on track to, to do that. Uh, I think you will see us pursue... Uh, new markets and and existing markets. So we will uh, hopefully get into the Pittsburgh market next year, and and then sprinkle some some other clubs uh, throughout our, our chain. Uh, as we look forward to the following year, we see a path towards 10 clubs, uh, but we are a long way away from that. As as you know, real estate is a is a uh, is a, is a game full of uh, full of surprises. So uh, as we get through next year, we'll certainly give a more robust update into the into that, but I think the, the same uh, the same function will hold, where we will look to uh, open at least one new market in that in that year, and then and then add into our existing markets as we go. That sounds great. Thanks so much. No problem. Thanks, Robbie. Your next question comes from Chuck Grom of Golden Husket. The line is open. Hey, um, great quarter. Thanks. Um, just wondering if we could just dive into the, the components of the gross margin uh, strength up 10 basis points, which is better than the front half of the year. And then looking ahead, if you had any thoughts um, with regards to the, how do you think the fourth quarter could play out? Hey, Jock, it's Bob again. Um, uh, so so maybe I'll, I'll touch on the gross margin one and, and, uh, and Lee can pile on uh, as, as we go. So certainly uh, we saw Great performance from a gross margin perspective. Uh, in, in terms of total gross margin, uh, gasoline had a great quarter, and inside the box had a great quarter. Uh, you know, 10 basis points of merchandise margin inside the box. There were puts and takes against that, as we talked about in the prepared remarks. The biggest gain was our continuing success uh, with our CPI program. Uh, that that effort continues to move forward, as we've talked about. Uh, you know, moving more towards uh, assortment changes and getting into growthier and, and margin heavier categories uh, versus just uh, classic negotiation tactics, as we've as we've talked about in the past. Uh, so great success from a, a CPI perspective. 
we did see some um, some increased uh, uh, distribution costs that were primarily COVID related. We are uh, doing the same things in our distribution centers that we are doing in our clubs and frankly in our home office, uh, just to try and keep everyone uh, everyone safe and healthy as as we go, and uh, and that that weighed on on gross profit a bit. Uh, Versus the front half of the year, we had uh, a much better inventory position, uh, particularly in, in apparel. And so uh, where we talked about in the first quarter, pretty significant markdowns uh, in apparel, we, we did not experience those uh, in, in the third quarter. And, and finally, uh, with the investments in price, we, we, we typically do that uh, as just part of the everyday. As you, as you know, it's a, it's a big part of uh, the, the club industry maintaining the value that that we offer to our members, which is which is tremendous, and and, and why they pay their membership fees. Uh, we did see some inflation during the quarter, although not terribly material, uh, particularly in in beef. And so we did we did invest in price in in those categories and uh, and a few others uh, as we, as we went throughout the quarter. So uh, all altogether, very very happy with. Uh, with the, the Q4 margin profile and, uh, and and what made it up. Any uh, any thoughts for how uh, fourth you could play out? Hey, um, Chuck, I'll I'll jump in on on fourth quarter. Um, you know, just to set the stage for that question, let me just um, reiterate some of what Bob said on the membership because it is the the bedrock. Um, you know, we feel great about the membership. We have more members. The quality of them is really strong, and so. We track um, the underlying quality, looking at uh, how many people we have in different cohorts, how much they pay, and we're seeing more or less every cohort paying more with more members. They're younger, they're digitally engaged, and they're shopping more. And so the uh, you know the business began to strengthen in the back half of uh, of Q3, particularly in the last couple weeks of October. Um, as we said in the prepared remarks, that's continued into uh, into November, and. If you think about the you know the broader environment, obviously uh, Q3 as it relates to the pandemic was a period of um, you know more relative normalcy with warmer weather, the ability to eat in restaurants, etc. And as that changes in our footprint, um, we would you know expect to see a, a strong business. The the big question um, clearly is the uh, kind of holiday gatherings and, and parties. We are expecting uh, fewer of those, which is a big part of our our, our business but just an increase overall in at-home food consumption and investment at home, and investment in gift-giving uh, for the holidays. And so, you know, as we sit here today, we feel um, like the Q4, like Q4 is in very good shape. Okay, great. And then just just to follow up on that, you know, you guys continue to make you know, great progress on, on the SKU rationalization program. I guess, can you, can you talk about some of the things you're changing for the holiday? And, and I guess just to kind of dovetail Bob's comments about, it seems like the, the baton is getting passed a little bit from – uh, CPI being a, a a major driver on the core margins, potentially these, some of these assortment changes um, helping you guys lean into the, to higher merchandise margin rates in, in, in the home categories or, or furniture categories. Just so maybe we could just talk a little bit about SPRAT and then also how that how that could help uh, on the gross margin line. Thanks. Uh, sure. So I think you know the overall premise of your your question is uh, is right. Um, you know, in the short term, uh, the team, you know, the merchants, the planning team, the supply chain team have been extraordinarily focused on uh, keeping the stores well stocked. Um, you clearly, when you're running uh, at the comp level, we've been running, uh, it begins to stretch the system thin, and there's been shortages on key products. And so um, we have made uh, a number of, uh, of changes the, to just keep the, uh, keep the buildings in stock, the members uh, satisfied. As you think about uh, the longer term uh, shifts that we're, we're driving, um, you're right. We're uh, we're thinking about how do we drive uh, growth uh, in the business. That includes a simplification in some of the core categories where we've been um, over assorted, and an investment in uh, categories that are on trend. Uh, things like uh, healthy organic uh, foods. Uh, we talked about alternative snacking, um, but also into categories where we haven't uh, historically played. And so, as an example, uh, we launched um, fitness equipment uh, this past uh, quarter with a treadmill and an exercise bike at significantly higher uh, AURs than uh, we normally would carry and are seeing uh, seeing really good results with those items. And that um, that overall shift uh, away from a real concentration in, in places where, you know, frankly, we just felt like we were over-assorted to uh, new categories that are uh, growing on trend where we have uh, an ability and a right to play. Uh, it brings more excitement to the, uh, to the club. Um, 
changes that the change will make. Um, it's also worth uh, highlighting services in that shift. And uh, services is an area where we're just incredibly excited about, uh, about the growth potential. Um, this has historically been our, our optical business, our travel business. Um, and as we invest more in that, including a dedicated merchant team, we're just finding uh, really fantastic and exciting uh, growth opportunities uh, in new areas. Uh, as we said, this past quarter, we relaunched major appliances and believe uh, that alone can be a material contributor uh, to growth going forward. And so uh, you'll see us keep going down that path. Uh, the only piece that we um, didn't touch on is, uh, is private label. Uh, that will continue to be a focus area uh, given the ability to offer better values to members that improved economics for us. Um, in the short term, um, we've obviously uh, been really just focused on getting product in the, in the building, so a little bit less on, uh, on private label, but over the long term, that's a major focus as well. Your next question comes from Peter Benedict of Berg. Your line is open. Hey, guys. Good morning. Um, uh, two questions. First, just uh, uh, on the MFI growth, um, just given the dynamics of, of what, you, what you know today, just curious how do you think about the shape of the, of the growth curve? I mean, I'm not asking for necessarily specific numbers, but um, would you think that the um, – that the growth rate kind of peaks in 4Q of this year and then starts to moderate a little bit or earlier next year is the peak. Just trying to understand how you think about that, uh, given the current um, signups you have. That's my first question. I mean, I think, I think the, the right answer is it's a, a little bit hard to say. There's no doubt that the broad trends in the pandemic are, um, are causing numbers to seek out value, buying in bulk sizes. Um, in our particular uh, value proposition. And I think as you've seen that flow through the business, um, you know, particularly with the Northeast being heavily affected at the start of a, a pandemic in Q1, uh, kind of rolling into the broader geographies in Q2, uh, somewhat of a return to, you know, relative normalcy in Q3, um, those trends are clearly paying forward. Um, you know, the, the hope is um, as we move into the winter months, um, the public health crisis uh, is more controlled, although that doesn't seem terribly well aligned with uh, the headlines um, and you know, where we're heading in the, in the short run. And so I suspect you'll see um, growth that um, falls out of that, um, you know, that overall situation as people are eating more at home or they're seeking, seeking value. Uh, we're just incredibly uh, on trend. Um, you know, the long-term question is um, how many of those members will we be able to hold on to um, as the world uh, hopefully returns to normal um, in, you know, the, you know, the middle uh, to the latter part of, of next year. And, you know, based on what we see now, we, we feel good about that. We have um, members who are engaging with us in a, um, a more elevated way than we would normally see. The quality of the membership is, uh, is high. We know that a lot of the changes we've made to the base platform were things we wanted people to experience, and um, the pandemic has created a, a platform uh, to do that. And so, you know, our, our hope is that we'll be able to, uh, to hold on to uh, the membership gains and see a multi-year growth story fall out of uh, the kind of the one-time unique event we're, we're experiencing now. Uh, so that, that's helpful, Lee. And I guess um, my second question is just, you kind of alluded to this a couple of times, um, you know, your, your, your sense that for 21, you know, I expect some of these trends to continue at least through the first half. So I'm just curious, you know, with the, with the benefit of, of hindsight, you know, we went through the first lockdown last spring, um, obviously, Feel like unfortunately I'm moving into something similar here. How are you? How are you buying for the first half of 21? I mean, g given the experience you had earlier this year, are there things that you're doing now that that may position you better uh, to be able to um, handle what what could could be ahead? Um, I'm just just curious on how you're just planning the first half overall of 21. It certainly sounds like um, you're not expecting uh, any material slowdown, but just wanted to hear you out on that. Thank you. Yeah, I, we're we're buying um, as aggressively as we as we can. Um, you know, the um, the buildings are are very clean from an inventory uh, standpoint, particularly in some of the general merchandise uh, categories. Um, and we're still running at an in stock level below uh, what we would like. There have just been uh, shortages in a number of uh, categories, and the uh, inventory is turning so quickly that. Um, it's you know, frankly hard to hard to keep up. If we could trade uh, uh, cash for inventory, uh, we would uh, we would definitely uh, do that. And uh, you know, I think we all hope 
that uh, public health crisis updates as quickly as possible. Um, it, um, but as you, as you sit here today and you look at the kind of the incidence of disease, the testing rates, um, and then the likely timeline for the vaccine distribution, it unfortunately seems like uh, we're in for an extended period of, of hardship, eating at home, uh, renewed uh, bans on, uh, on restaurants, et cetera. Again, we hope those things don't come to pass, but uh, as we plan and buy for the business, uh, we're anticipating that elevated demand continues, uh, certainly for the short term. Okay. All right, fair enough. Thanks so much. Your next question comes from Chris Hovers of JP Morgan. The line is open. Thanks, Guy. A couple of expense questions and one follow up. So, so first on the uh, the gas, you know, profitability side, uh, how much uh, would you say you sort of over earned on on gas, if at all, uh, here in the third quarter, as we're as we're building out our, our models for next year, uh, and then on the expense front. You talked about COVID costs accelerating in the fourth quarter relative to the cost in the fourth quarter. What drives that? Uh, and then within gross margin, would you expect, uh, you know, higher COVID costs plus higher parcel ship to mitigate any merchandise margin expansion in 4Q? Hey, hey Chris, it's Bob. Um, you know, the, the expense uh, the expenses story in Q3 was – was frankly a great one, as you can see the the incredible leverage we had uh, on SGNA. Um, I think the the look forward uh, and and updating a little bit of guidance from the 17 million dollars of, of COVID expenses in Q3 more towards uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of twice that uh, really dovetails nicely with with Lee's comments about our our view of the the course of the public health crisis and. Uh, this is an incredibly hard thing to predict, but uh, we uh, will do the same thing we've done uh, the entirety of this public health crisis and do everything in our power to protect our members and our team members as, as they're in our stores and distribution centers and home office. And uh, unfortunately, the path of the disease looks like uh, it's accelerating, and so we are tying our estimate of, uh, of COVID-related costs to that fact. Uh, should it improve, we'll do better. Should it get worse, we will spend more uh, keeping keeping our members and team members safe. It's it's really as, as simple as that, uh, and so that's that's why we chose to, uh, uh, you know, give, give that that in, that increase in, in guidance. Hopefully, we'll be able to do better than what we what we put out there. That the, the virus won't be uh, won't be all, all that bad. Uh, you know, certainly. Uh, Certainly, the gas business had a great quarter this quarter, and it has throughout the entire year. We've gained tremendous share, as we talked about in the prepared remarks. Our, our comp uh, gallons sold at comp clubs were up two, and the market's down uh, double digits. We call it call it 15. Uh, so we are we are gathering tremendous market share. That's been a, a, a fact all all year as well. Uh, and and you know, profitability wise, uh, call it a handful of million million dollars. Uh, extra in this in this quarter as you think about the setup for uh, for q3 next year uh, so a great quarter uh, for sure but uh, you know not not going to bend the trend uh, of our overall growth for, for next year as, as we go uh, maybe I'll let Lee jump in and, and talk a little bit about your parcel question uh, on, on gross profit uh, and, and talk about our Omni business yeah I think um we're certainly seeing some constraints in the, you know, the broader freight market, including, uh, including parcel rates. Um, as you think about our uh, Omni business, uh, you know, which, as we noted, is uh, is still growing at a remarkable rate, with up 200% uh, growth. Um, the bulk of that growth uh, and the bulk of the demand uh, comes through uh, buy online pickup and club uh, same day uh, delivery. Uh, both of which aren't uh, impacted directly by uh, freight expense, other than the, you know the broad supply chain uh, challenge of getting those items to the, the store, just like every uh, just like every other item. And so, uh, in those regards, uh, we expect uh, to see increased uh, demand for those uh, services. You know, curbside, in particular, fresh curbside, uh, is working very well for us. When it uh, comes to the shift uh, uh, to home business, um, you know, we um, we did see this. Uh, coming and uh, negotiated 
uh, contracts and um, and uh, in parcel rates ahead of time, uh, along with uh, increased levels of demand. Um, and so we feel pretty good about uh, where we are. Um, the levels of inventory we have, the likely markdown exposure on inventory uh, will will be lighter than normal, just given how quickly things are turning. And so from an overall uh, margin standpoint, um, we're not terribly worried about the, the parcel cost, um, uh, given those you know, kind of those broad factors. Got it. That's very helpful. <clears throat> just as a follow-up, then on the the membership side, I understand you don't want to guide, and there's a lot of variables, and you know maybe the recent surge helps signups and and reacceleration reacceleration of customer acquisition. Um, but maybe you could give us uh, cash MFI in the third quarter, you know, relative to the 15, 16 percent that you saw in the first half, just as, as we try to, you know, take a shot at building out the model right now. The, you know, consensus is looking for about another 12 percent gain in MFI dollars year over year in 4Q. Yeah, I'll, I'll take that, Chris. So uh, we. We didn't offer cash MFI this quarter and, and probably won't. Uh, we offered that statistic in, in the prior two quarters, having never talked about it before, because we thought it would help illustrate the, the incredible momentum we had behind the business. Uh, and while it might have done that, uh, it also created a lot of confusion and misunderstanding uh, in the analyst and investor communities. Uh, and so we, we, you know, in stepping back after uh, after the second quarter, we, we thought we we might have created a problem when we were trying to just illustrate the tremendous uh, trends in our in our business. So uh, we hesitate to offer it again. We'll certainly talk about accounting MFI, uh, which was up 11. Uh, you know, we've talked about the the total net member growth up 630,000. Uh, we've talked about our hopes for uh, for uh, renewal rates as, as the member uh, you know the member data would look like. Uh, these these folks will be sticky. Uh, and, and so I, I, I hesitate to, to give you the cash MFI. Uh, and instead, I'd, I'd concentrate on the on the record MFI, the record membership counts, the strong momentum we've we've had, and uh, and, the, and the improving quality throughout the membership base as well. Okay. So then, just as a follow-up, so if you know if if the membership base is up sort of 12 percent a year on a year-over-year -year basis, <clears throat> and you've got transition up. To higher tiers um, and, and, and a, a more expensive um, sort of um, fee there, plus the fact that you know it seems like your, the level of discounted membership uh, is below what you had been running last year. You know, sort of the, the that 12% growth in membership sort of sets the base, sets a, a, you know sort of at a minimum the baseline. Um, uh, you know, in terms of the, the the growth rate, I think you're thinking about the pieces of it cor correctly, right? There's the total net member growth, uh, which is which is up as you as you point out. Uh, there is a bit of a uh, a, a favorable mix shift uh, in in the premium memberships as uh, as we get people more up into the tiers and into the co-brand product, as as you point out, that would build upon the the, the the, the member growth as we try and build out MFI. There's also a slight offsetting mix shift as uh, as you just think about the math involved uh, with just having more new members versus more tenured members, more renewal members. Uh, those renewal members are generally paying full freight across the board, and the, the new members are uh, somewhat discounted. And so uh, you just have to think about those those two mix shifts that, that somewhat offset. and uh, and, and you kind of get back to the, the, the something around the, the net member growth. Makes sense. Thanks for that. Very helpful. Your next question comes from Kate McShane of Goldman Sachs. Your line is open. Hi. Good morning. Thanks for taking my question. Um, this might be a little too narrow, but I was just curious to hear a little bit more about the Michigan stores, the, the membership per store being, I think you said 20% higher than the company average uh, is impressive. Just wondered if you could give some insight as to what you think the combination of factors are that's helping drive this. And you know, as you think about introducing BJs into new markets, you know, are there any learnings from 
uh, Michigan, uh, being that it was a newer market. Yeah, well, why don't I start and, and Bob can jump jump in. Um, you know, we're, we're very excited about the, the results in, in Michigan uh, with now um, you know, three clubs with two open uh, for a, a longer period of, uh, of time. And as we noted, uh, we are seeing membership accounts that are uh, 20% above what we would see uh, across the chain. Um, you know, it's a combination of things that are driving that growth. Uh, one is um, just uh, investing more in membership acquisition um, pre-open and during the open. And with you know, more confidence about the potential for our, our franchise and a greater ability to invest uh, into the, uh, the buildings uh, in the membership uh, drive, we've been able to, uh, to drive more excitement in the market, see higher signups both pre and post open, which has been very exciting. Up two is uh, we've really refined the offering. And so a number of the changes that we aspire to make across the, the chain uh, when it comes to assortment, the in club environment, uh, signage, uh, the integration of Omni. Um, we do from the very start in in uh, in new clubs, and so as you put those kind of two pieces together, um, more members at open, um, and uh, improved experience uh, right out of the gate, we are you're very hopeful about the potential for those uh, those clubs, and it gives us confidence to uh, into invest into new geographies. Uh, the big question about Michigan was uh, we didn't have um, much in the way of of brand equity, uh, unlike you would see. Um, on the, the eastern seaboard, uh, but we've quickly built uh, a franchise there that we're, you know, we're very excited about, and it gives us confidence that we can grow into more uh, new markets at an accelerated rate. And so as we think about um, upping the count to six clubs uh, next year, hopefully closer to, uh, to 10 uh, or more in the out years, uh, we do that quite bullishly. Thank you. Thanks, Kate. Your next question comes from Edward Kelly of Wells Fargo. Your line is open. Yeah, hi. Good morning, guys. So, uh, Lee, my question is for you. you know, when, you went, when you guys went public, um, you, know, you introduced an earning al earnings algorithm um, that, that now you know, kind of seems conservative. Um, you, know, you talked about 1% to 2% you know, unit growth, 1% to 2% comps. Could you just maybe take a step back for us and you know, fundamentally talk about, you know, talk fundamentally about what's really changed with the business since then um, and how that potentially could impact um, the algorithm uh, of the company over time? Um, sure. Thank, thanks, Ed. I think it's a you know, really good question. Um, we certainly feel like the, um, the long-term al algorithm today is considerably ahead of what we would have described at the IPO. You know, there's a few things playing out. Uh, you know, one is um, you know the variety of investments and initiatives we had talked about in the IPO are gaining uh, traction, and so it's our ability to invest into the membership with uh, greater data and science. It's our changes to uh, the merchandising, the assortment, uh, the marketing. Uh, it's our building of uh, of the Omni system, and then it's our acceleration of of real estate. And um, those are the same basic themes that we talked about at IPO, uh, but we've just further developed our our ability uh, and capability, and then clearly, you know, the pandemic is uh, is just such a unique cir unique circumstance where um, a lot of the things that we wanted members to uh, experience or new members to uh, to try um, were all accelerated by um, just the incredible relevance that that we have. Right, we're, we operate very large buildings uh, that I think afford um, more of a sense of, of safety because people are are more spread out. We're selling. Uh, bulk groceries as people uh, need to uh, eat more at home, and we're doing it at industry-leading prices as people um, need to need to save money. And then uh, the Omni offerings really, uh, really work. And so the, the recent launch of curbside and um, and curbside fresh is just incredibly, uh, incredibly relevant. And the advantage economics we have there, we think, is uh, uh, a part of the equation that can give us uh, the long-term ability to invest in those businesses. Uh, ahead of what others might be uh, might be comfortable doing, and so it's kind of a, a combination of um, acceleration in the uh, in the broad themes we talked about uh, at IPO from um, some of the initiatives getting more steam, and then just an incredible shot of adrenaline tied to the, the pandemic and our increased relevance. Uh, but we do feel really good about the long-term state of the business. 
And just from a from a store growth standpoint, um, you know, as we think about where you're going over time, um, you know, and you talk about you know six next year, and and I think you know the the hope to get to ten or better. Uh, why can't the number be higher than that? You know, if, if you're having success in these new markets, and you know the merchandising side is aligning, and you know Michigan's going very well, um, you know what what's the governor around that? I think the um, the short answer is that it can be. Uh, the governor is finding uh, real estate and and developing it, and so um, we have a, a quite aggressive uh, push in, internally to um, to find and develop um, sites and and properties. And um, we'd love to move at a faster rate, but you know, as you just think about the challenge of finding uh, that many sites and moving at a, a faster rate, uh, we're governed um, you know, simply by our ability to. Um, to make progress, it's you know less so from a, a financial attractiveness standpoint. Great, thank you. Your next question comes from Steph. We we think of Jeffrey. Your line is open. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Most of our questions have been asked, but I wanted to just tug on a couple of threads uh, based on your response to the prior question. Uh, I, if we're hearing you correctly, it sounds like you know, one of your agendas is to really attract that millennial household uh, fitness equipment. You've talked about furniture, good for you food, health and beauty. So if you can talk a little bit about how you think about marketing, digital activation, customer acquisition through the lens of that next generation household and how you might be the, the chosen club for that emerging household. And then secondarily, how that factors into your thoughts around real estate and co-tenancy. Are there certain retailers, as you think, over the course of the next three to five years that are the more ideal co-tenants maybe versus what would have been three to five years ago? Thank you. Yeah, thank, thanks, Stephanie. Let me um, take the, the first part, and then maybe, Bob, you can jump in on the on the real estate side of things. You know, for us, the, um, the, the relevance of our channel is really around um, home ownership and family formation, and um, you know, as we think about growing the membership, the ideal thing for us to do would be to uh, engage people uh, right at those two life moments. And uh, the sooner we're able to uh, to do that, the better, because you see an acceleration in spend. And so, as we look at you know the members that spend the most, it'll tend to be you know the family of, uh, of with three or four. Uh, teenage uh, children in the house who are just eating you out of uh, out of house and home, uh, but to get them earlier, uh, we need to market to them and make sure our assortment is uh, is relevant. And you know, frankly, we just um, you know we we needed to uh, to revolutionize the uh, the assortment a bit, and that's what you're seeing us doing. It's really understanding uh, what the growth rates look like across different um, food, non-edible grocery uh, categories. How do you invest in things that are uh, relevant to a younger consumer that will tend to skew towards um, healthier foods, um, natural uh, household cleaners, um, and the like. It'll also um, uh, apply to uh, to our general merchandise uh, assortment, uh, where you know getting bigger into connected home, um, investing more in uh, in furniture, uh, as you know, into fitness equipment, are all categories that we know will appeal and work to that uh, younger member, and we have the right to play. And so we are um, you know, broadly transforming our assortment to, to fit that demand. And then, you know, as we said, we think services can be a big part of that as well, where um, there's just a whole host of categories where we can offer phenomenal value uh, that are relevant to uh, a new homeowner, uh, a new family. And so you'll see us continue to invest uh, into those, uh, those elements. And you, Bob, do you want to talk about the, the co-tenancy real estate part? Yeah, th thanks, Stephanie. I think that, that's a really smart extension of your question uh, and, and really highlights something that we've been doing for the last couple of years, which uh, if you think back to uh, some of the older uh, clubs in, in, in our base and in our competitors, our club competitors base, uh, you know, you'd, see, you'd see clubs in, uh, in distribution uh, parks and, and office parks and all, uh, you know, hidden behind uh, berms and all sorts of things. And, and in more recent years, uh, they've they've been in places that have much more uh, classic retail gravity, and I think you'll see us uh, continue to to do that, uh, where you know the the retail gravity and the traffic that that brings outweighs what might be extra cost in those uh, in those sites, uh, you know, versus something in an office park or, or the like. Uh, 
And, and so as we look at, at real estate sites going forward, we are we are very much looking for uh, active, uh, great traffic sites. Uh, and and then the, you know the, the other retail names you would uh, not be su- surprised by, right? The the, the TJX companies, uh, Dick Sporting Goods, uh, Cabela's, you know, the, the really uh, uh, high draw uh, retailers. Are, are great for our business when we are uh, positioned nearby or, or, or next door uh, in, the, in the same shopping center. So it's, it's a great question. It's certainly something we're looking at. Thank you. And your last question comes from Rutesh Parit of Oppenheimer. Your line is open. Good morning. Thanks for taking my question. So I, I have a quick one just on cash flow. So we saw a pretty significant improvement in your APU leverage. So just curious, as you look at your your uh, the improvement, what you view as more one time in nature versus more sustainable, and also just in general, as you look at your cash flows, was there anything that you view as more transitory um, in in the cash generation this year? Thank you. Uh, here, Pesh, I'll, I'll take that one. Um, so uh, we we're very pleased with our with our Q3 cash flows. Uh, you know, as, as we talked about in the in the prepared remarks, we typically don't make. Uh, make cash in Q3 as we're buying inventory ahead of the holidays. We came out of the quarter with uh, with 20 odd million dollars in, in free cash, and to your to your point, uh, good AP leverage. Uh, you know, it, it is uh, it, it is really a tale of two cities, right? We we added a, a bunch of inventory during the quarter, which we're happy about. To Lee's earlier comments, we are buying inventory with both hands uh, as the business uh, has has ticked up in the last couple of weeks. Uh, and uh, you know, AP uh, decelerated a bit in the beginning of the quarter, and now has has accelerated back up a little bit uh, as as the inventory spins a, a bit faster. And so there is going to be some variation from an AP leverage perspective going forward uh, that is probably most uh, closely tied to comps. Uh, but this this quarter, as we built inventory, you had uh, you know had a little bit of an, an offset to that too. Uh, so I think we'll, we'll watch that. We're not we're not worried about the AP leverage. We do expect over the long term, uh, you know, as, as the public health crisis uh, abates, that uh, comps will, uh, you know, will moderate a bit. And as that happens, AP leverage will moderate a bit. Uh, but in any case, as with uh, nearly everything we've we've talked about, the post pandemic BJs will be better than the pre pandemic BJs and. Our AP uh, leverage is, is is no different than that. Okay, great. And then maybe just one follow-up. So the quarter-to-date strength that you guys saw, um, what did you see from consumers, I guess, stocking up again? And, um, and and also any sense of whether your November so far has benefited from maybe early promotions versus the prior year? Um, this is Lee. I, I think um, we're certainly starting to see the, the signs of another uh, stock up wave as you look at things of you know things like canned uh, vegetables and uh, and paper products uh, people are, are buying more aggressively um, and so I suspect that's happening um, you know there's no doubt there's a little bit of benefit from the early Black Friday uh, promotions but if you think about the um, the breakdown in our our business and the, the scale of general merchandise versus food um, we're seeing really good momentum uh, in the, the food and traditional grocery categories. And that's the, the overriding um, thing that will um, that'll make or break uh, uh, you know, kind of the, the quarter, particularly the holiday uh, season. So, um, so far, momentum looks uh, looks quite promising. Great. Thank you. Best of luck for the balance of the year. Thank you. You too. Thank you. I'll now turn the call over to Mr. Lee for closing remarks. Great. Uh, you know, thank you, uh, everyone, for uh, for listening to the call, for your engagement, and for your interest in the company. We really appreciate um, your your time and your your interest. Um, you know, until we talk again, uh, please stay uh, safe and, and healthy. We wish you all the best for the holidays. Uh, take care. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's conference call. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.